which is an authentic hadith narrated in Ahmad as classified as Sahih according to scholars including Shaykh al -Bani. Once Prophet Sallallahu with the companions there, he drew four lines in the ground. And he said to the people, what is these four lines? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, you know best, you tell us what this is. So he said that these four lines represent four people. Can people here tell me who are these four people who Muslims have mentioned? You've got to get this first of them right. One of them that we're talking about today. He's, he mentioned the names of four women. Who are the four women that he mentioned? Asya, Rajra, Asya, Maryam, Fatima, the daughter. Fatima, the and and Khadija, the Right? And another hadith. He said there are many men who perfected the religion and amongst the women who perfected the religion and he mentioned this. Now let me ask you all this question before we go any further. Here is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam singling out these four women and saying they have perfected their religion. What, what are you thinking right now? What's going through your mind? Just subhanAllah. SubhanAllah, absolutely. <laughs> Glory be to Allah, how perfect Allah is. Absolutely. Let's go further. What, what are you thinking? Lucky, Lucky, fortunate, mashallah, absolutely. You know, we all wish to perfect our religion, isn't it? And here is Musa Sallam, we actually four, four people. Role models. Role models, absolutely. You know, we would look up to them. Just imagine in our day to day world, they bring, uh, what's his name, Lionel Messi, <laughs> right? Or they bring uh, a, a politician, or they bring a, the best cricket player in the world, or the best singer, or the best model, or whatever it might be. And the masses, thousands and millions of people, look up to them, that they have perfected themselves in this world, of course. They have achieved what nobody else will achieve. And people look up to them. I don't want to know more about them. Even sometimes we might even not know somebody. And somebody else says, you know, so and so. Like it happened to me one day, subhanAllah, I was invited to a debate. And I was sitting down, because I have to do a talk as well, amongst other people. Now I knew that the people that were there were also presenting, so I knew there was somebody, but I didn't have a, there was one person I didn't know who it was. <coughs> and anyway, we met and we talked and stuff. So I said, you know, what's your name? He told me his name. I said, okay, great name, mashallah, that's good. And then we started talking a little bit. And I said to him in the conversation, I said, brother, what do you do? He said, I play cricket. Oh, okay. I said, who do you play for? He goes, I play for Australia. I go, uh-oh, I think I'm a bit stupid here. Because I should have recognized this person, but I haven't recognized him. All the people that were there had come to see him and talk to him. Right? They come to get his autograph and circles like that. Now here I am, I knew nothing about him because I don't actually follow cricket very much. But suddenly, the fact that people think of him as somebody great, people are vouching for his greatness, he somehow straight away takes a bit of greatness with me as well. I'm thinking, oh, okay, this guy's great. There's something about him. Now here is Muhammad Sallallahu vouching for these four women. And of course, if Muhammad Sallallahu vouches for them, who's going to question? So straight away we're thinking, wow, these are great women. And we're thinking, Muhammad Sallallahu said he they perfected their religion. What does it mean to perfect their religion? What does it mean to perfect their religion? You know, we are living here a whole life. A whole life is our deen, is our religion. Our way of life is our religion, is our deen. And constantly, every day, we're trying to improve ourselves as much as we can. Now here the Muslim Hassan say, these women, these women have done such a thing, such a thing that is so great that he, Muhammad Sallam, is saying they have perfected the religion. So straight away, what I'm thinking is, I want to know about these women. I want to know about these women. I don't care about Messi and I don't care about anybody else. I want to know about these women who Muhammad Sallam says they have perfected the religion. That's an awesome thing. Don't you think? Who here would like Muhammad to say about themselves that Ahmad has perfected his religion? 
or khala to practice religion. Won't you? Even if somebody, nobody, calls you up to the stage and says so-and-so has won a prize because they were the best student in this or best in this, suddenly we feel so happy. It makes not just you, but imagine if the Prophet of Allah is saying about you. But of course, the Prophet of Allah is not here. And he's not going to say that about us. But we can still, inshallah, do our best to get ourselves as close to Allah as we can. The question, of course, is how? The answer to that is, let's have a look at what these women have done. What is it about them? What is it about them that makes the Muslims say they have perfected their religion? So let's today, very briefly, in the time that we have, look at one of these women, Maryam al -Salam. And even with that, of course, we're not going to have time to go through all her life. Because that is too long. So what we'll do is we'll just get a couple of examples of her greatness. A couple of things that is mentioned in the Quran that tells us about their greatness. And we will see why is it that that is a great thing. And we'll try and see how is it that they have attained it. How is it that they have attained this greatness that we all want to attain as well. So let's have a look now. Let's go back, rewind to perhaps 2000 or more years ago at the time of the birth of Muhammad Isa alayhi salam. And in fact, let's rewind just a little bit before that as well. At the time of the birth of Maryam alayhi salam. Now her father was Imran. And her mother, as is mentioned, was also a righteous woman. And a Muslim as well. Now when she became pregnant, when she became pregnant, this is the mother of Maryam alayhi salam. When she became pregnant, what did she do? Who here has children, by the way? One, two, three, four. What did you do, brothers? When you found out that your wife is pregnant, what did you do? You pray for them. You pray? You pray for them to be staunch Muslims. Absolutely, right? We pray for them to be good Muslims. We thank Allah Ta'ala. We thank Allah Ta'ala for the blessing He's about to give us. You know, the vast majority of people don't do that. The vast majority of people are looking and dreaming about this world. If I'm going to have a boy, I want him to be the best cricket, you know, player and batsman in the world. Or I want such and such to be a doctor. I want my child to be this and I want my child to be that. And we start straight away to have dreams about our son or our daughter that we're going to have. And we're thinking, oh, this is what I want. This is what I've been waiting for. And all the dreams that we've ever had, we want them fulfilled through our children. So, likewise, the mother of Maryam a.s. devotes and turns to Allah when she finds out she's pregnant. Now, this is at a time, mind you, when for centuries Allah has sent prophet after prophet after prophet to the Bani Israel. And they will reject and they will kill. So those people who are known to be the religious people, and amongst them the best being the prophets, were being killed by the people. They were being rejected. And yet, this woman, when she's pregnant, what does she say to Allah? She says to Allah, Oh Allah, I would like to devote my child to your service. I would like to devote my child to your service. And accept this from me. That in itself, that du'a of a mother, because remember Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the du'a of a parent towards his or her child is accepted. Here in these difficult circumstances, she is promising to Allah, she is making du'a to Allah, Oh Allah, this child that you are giving me, I am going to dedicate this child in your service, in your path, in your religion, to do the work of your religion. While everybody else out there might be doing other things, while everybody else has the worldly dreams about their children, here she is having an amazing desire for her child. Now, of course, she doesn't have the benefit of ultrasound to know that she's going to have a boy or a girl. She's thinking in her mind that she's going to have a boy. So she's saying to Allah, oh Allah, I will devote him 
In what way? In Lam Muharram Ran Allah says in the word in the Quran, which is a person who just devotes themselves to Allah continuously, without any worldly desires or anything like that. And she is wishing for her child to be the leader amongst the people, to lead them to goodness. Now, of course, the leaders at that time were, of course, the men. And this is what she's contemplating in her mind. Then Allah says, when she delivered the child, she realized it was a girl. So she said, oh Allah, I have delivered a girl. And what does Allah say? And Allah is aware that you have delivered a girl. This is the version of this we started at the start. Allah is aware what you have just delivered. And Allah also says, Allah is aware that a boy and a girl is not the same thing. A boy and a girl is not the same thing in the sight of the people. Because the people are thinking they want boys. We read about history. Even till now, even till today, what do people want? They want ten boys and one girl. In fact, most people don't want ten children. But they want boy after boy after boy, and at the end they just want a girl just to finish it off. Because they think if they have a boy, it's a matter of pride. It's a matter of prestige. It's going to get the money when he grows up and goes on earth. It's going to bring money to them. It's going to bring strength and power and position. And when they find that they have, they're having a daughter, they're feeling sad. This has been around for thousands of years. This we see even to today. The jahala, the ignorance, we see even to today. So Allah says, He is aware that to you people, a boy and a girl is different. And implied in that sentence is that to Allah, there is no difference. To Allah, there is no difference. But the best amongst us is who? The one who is the most pious. The one who does the most good things. So Allah says to her, the mother of Maryam, when Maryam is born, Allah is away. You just had a daughter. So then, subhanAllah, here she was, when she was pregnant, making dua to Allah and promising Allah, I'm going to divide my child to you. Now Allah is testing her and has given her a daughter. Now, according to the societal norms, she could have gone and killed that baby and buried it alive. Or hidden it from everybody. Or cried and cried and cried and thought, Oh, my God has not favored me. But instead she turns back to Allah. And she thanks Allah for what He has given her. And she then goes and fulfills her promise. She asks Allah, Oh Allah, protect my child and her descendants from shaitan. So she makes a dua to Allah when the child is born to protect this child and whoever she, when she grows up and has children, protect them all from the shaitan. And Allah says He accepted that from her. So now let's have a look. Let's have a look at this young girl, Maria Maria What we learn about her, as her mother had promised, is that she would devote her time to the worship of Allah. She would be constantly worshipping Allah. She would be constantly doing the Salah. And Allah put in charge of her Zakariyah, the Prophet Zakariyah, to look after her affairs, to make sure she has what she needs of this dunya, to protect her. And so on and so on. So what we learn in the Quran, Allah says that whenever Zakariya would enter the mihrab, the place where Maryam salam would be worshipping Allah. Kullama dakhala alayya Zakariya al-mihrab wajada indaha rizqa. He would see that with her is the rizq. Qala ya Maryam anna laki hada. He said, Oh Maryam, where has all this stuff come from? 
She said, it is from Allah. Inna Allah yadhubu man yasha to be ghayri hisab. Verily Allah gives to whomever He wishes without putting any limit or without counting and without limiting. Let's have a look at this little dharma. Allah has put a man, a prophet in charge of looking after the affair of this woman whom Allah has blessed and chosen Bayyam alayhi salam. She, from being learned from this verse and from other verses, would be devoting her life in salah. She was known to pray and pray and pray and pray. Even the word Maryam, the name Maryam, its meaning is to abide, to stick down in such a way that that is all you do. So she would abide in the place of worship and she would spend her time worshiping Allah more and more and more. That is what she was named and that is what she used to do. Now just imagine my dear brothers, Imagine back 2,000 years ago, a woman is born, a girl is born, and the mother, instead of fearing what everybody else fears, devotes this girl to the worship of Allah. She's single, she's not married. She'll be worried about what? What would she be worried about? Every single thing that we all worry about, what are we worried about on a day-to-day -day basis? What do we worry about? Our food. Right? Our food, our shelter, our clothes. That's what we worry about, isn't it? What are these things called? If you were to put them into one word, what would we call it? The risk. The things that are necessary for us to live. So in the in the narrow sense, it you might say it's just the food and the water and let's say your oxygen or something. But in a slightly wider sense, it's everything that we need to live. Whether it's our clothing, whether it's shelter, happiness, peace of mind, and everything else that we need. This risk is what is driving every one of us to come to the university and to study. So that one day we might get a job. And not just that, one day we might get a good job. We might have enough money to buy for ourselves the food that until now our parents are buying for us. To buy for ourselves the clothing that until now our parents are buying for us. To one day become, one day get married and have children and provide for them and have sustenance and have a shelter of our head, have a car to drive, a home to live in and so on and so forth. This is the thing that we are all working towards. This is the thing that everybody is stressed about. This is the thing about which we spend hours every day. From the time we're young, our parents say to us, O oh son, O oh daughter, work hard, study hard, go to school, do your homework, and so on and so forth. They wake you up to make sure you've done your work. They might even give you a little stick when you haven't done your homework. Why? Because they are worried. They want you to grow up and then have a good enough job to then earn the money have a good position, and so on and so forth. That risk that your parents are worried about you, and then at one day, you take on the responsibility, and you are now concerned. You come to university, and then after that, you get a job. Look at the people out there who are working. Some people are working three or four days a week. Some are working five or six days a week. Some are working seven days a week. Some people are doing two jobs. Some people are doing three jobs. And not for what? Six months? For years after years after years. To the point that until they die, they're worried about the risk. Because that's the most basic necessity. Yet what does Allah teach us about Maryam alayhi salam? He says, كُلَّمَا دَخَلَ عَلَيْهَا زَكَرِيَّ مَكْرَابَ وَجَدَ عِنْدَهَا رِزْقَا Whenever Zakaria would come to make sure she has what she needs, what does he find? He finds that with her is all the things that she needs. He finds that Allah is taking care of her. Because he says, Oh, Maria, where is this coming from? You know, I'm in charge of looking after you, but you don't need me. I come to get your needs, your needs are already provided. This is in the real sense. So 
Does she say? Qala Ruhin Antillah. It is from Allah. What a beautiful and sweet answer. What a beautiful and sweet answer. Just a few words. Huwa min indillah. It is from Allah. That is it. And then look at her iman. She says, Inna Allah yarduqa man yasha wa bi ghayri insan. Verily Allah gives to whomever He wills without limiting it and taking account of it. So my dear brothers, this is the first thing, this is the first thing that we need to understand about this woman who Allah who says she has perfected her religion. Her iman is so strong, her iman is so strong, her taqwa is so high that she devotes her life in the prayer and service of Allah. While the society out there is worried with all the whispering of the shaitan, thinking that we need to get our own risk, Allah has given her the peace of mind. <coughs> Allah has given her the miracle, which is that Allah has given her the risk without her having to work for it. Truly, that is a miracle of Allah, but a miracle can occur for anybody. Even if a miracle was not to occur, we need to realize our risk is in whose hands? Whose hands is it in? It's in Allah's hands. Allah says in Surah Ali Imran, in another place, تُولِجُ اللَّيْلَ فِي النَّهَارِ وَتُولِجُ النَّهَارَ فِي اللَّيْلِ وَتُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّ مِنَ الْمَيِّتِ وَتُخْرِجُ الْمَيِّتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ وَتَرْزُقُ مَنْ تَشَاءُ بِغَيْرِ إِسَاءٍ Allah first says that He is the one who brings the day out when the night is finished. And He is the one who brings the night after the day. He is the one who brings, who gives life to the one who is dead, and he is the one who gives death to the one who is alive. Now just think about that for a second, my dear brothers. Allah is telling us about himself, how powerful he is, how able he is. He is able to bring the sun out and control what is in the heavens and the earth. And he is able to control life and everything that surrounds him. How powerful is Allah? Can you even doubt that Allah can't do something? Of course He can't. Then Allah says, He is the one, the one you think thinking is so powerful, so able, who is in control of everything. Well, He is the one who gives the risk to whom He wills. Now, so here is a reminder from Allah. Yes, you go out there and you work hard. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we don't work for our reason. We must work. As Muhammad Sallam said, all the prophets of Allah work with their hands. So we must work. We must work to earn our living. But at the same time as we're working, we do not forget Allah who is giving us this risk. The security, the food, the water, and everything else that we desire, and everything else that we need, that Maryam salam needed as well. Well, she entrusted Allah. You entrust yourself to Allah as well. This is the first lesson we learn from Maryam salam's life. She was not angel, as I say. She was a human being like every one of us. But her mother made a special dua for her. How fortunate she is. Her mother made a dua for her that Allah protect her and her descendants from the shaitan. And Allah accepted that. And then she did not break her promise. She taught her daughter. She taught her daughter, Maryam salam, from a young age to worship Allah. Now let us, my dear brothers, let us ask ourselves this question. We just heard that Maryam salam would spend hours worshiping Allah by herself. Nobody watching over her. Nobody's going to stick over her. Nobody's taking a photo and then putting it up and saying, look how good this woman is. She's not getting any worldly gain from it whatsoever. Neither fame, nor wealth, nor nothing. She's spending hours worshipping Allah. Let me ask everyone here, who has ever worshipped Allah in Salah for four hours continuously? Now, 
What about for two hours? What about for one hour? Alhamdulillah. But why? Why is it that many of us haven't done it? What is stopping us? What is stopping us? I want you all to tell me what are the barriers, what are the things that come in our way that stop us from worshipping Allah and prolonging our worship and increasing our worship of Allah. What are the barriers? Let's talk about it for a couple of minutes. Because here we learn about this great woman. The thing that made her great was her worship of Allah. Was her tawakkul in Allah. Was her trust in Allah. Was her belief in Allah. Was her the strength of her belief in Allah. So much so that Allah gave her the miracle. Which is He gave her all the risk without her having to do anything about it. Come on, let's, let's come up with a few ideas. Let's come up with a few things. What are the barriers to us, us worshipping Allah in a better way? When we stand up to pray, why do we have a prayer for 5 minutes instead of for 10 minutes? Let's think about it for a minute. Let's not worry about why we're not praying for an hour. Let's just talk about why is our two rakah lasting for 5 minutes and not for 10 minutes. What is it? What's going on? Our job. What about the job? You've got to get back to a job, okay? So you might be coming, uh, for example, in your lunch break or something like that. Yeah. And so you've got to get back to work. So then you're coming, you're looking at your watch, and thinking, okay, I've only got 15 minutes off. By the time you make the door, and then you pray, and you've got to go back, it's going to take you that much time. So you have to shorten your prayer. Okay, what else? What else? Our Iman. What do you mean by our Iman? Our uh, Iman is not strong enough such that? Such that? To stand in front of Allah. To stand in front of Allah. Excuse me, I want you to elaborate a little bit more. Uh, it's not the... It, every, every person has an Iman which brings him towards Allah. And that Iman is not strong enough so that he can go in front of Allah who is feeding him, who is keeping him alive. Is not virtually giving him, giving his head efforts and time. Right. So the person's iman is weak, such that even though he knows he's coming from Allah, he or she is not dedicating themselves. Because the prayer is many things, isn't it? The prayer is what we're asking Allah for. So when we stand up in the prayer, we make making du'a to Allah. First is Surah Fatiha, which is the Surah we saw in every, uh, in every, uh, uh, in our prayers. We're first praising Allah, we're acknowledging who Allah is. And then we're worshipping Allah, we're asking Allah, we make a dua to Him to give us X, Y, Z. But somewhere there's some weakness. Why? Where is this weakness coming from? The thoughts which comes uh, because of your uh, daily routines from the dunya? The thoughts that come to your mind about your daily routines in the dunya. Exactly. We are so preoccupied with our lives in a dunya sense that the prayer is taking less importance and everything else is taking more importance. Now Muhammad Sassam knew this. He even mentioned in authentic hadith as well. That the believer stands up to pray and after he's done Allah Akbar, the mind wavers and goes off and starts to think about what he's done before and what he's going to do afterwards. So we come, we make wudu, we think we're going to pray, as soon as Allah walks away, we start, another mind wave us off to what we've been doing before. All what we're going to do afterwards, today, tomorrow, the after tomorrow, this thought, that thought, that thought, all these thoughts, within a short period of time, which is two or three minutes of our salah, we think of a hundred things. Isn't it? Why? Why do we think about those things? Because our trust in Allah is so weak that we think we have to keep on thinking of these things. We have to keep on working hard. We've got to get back to work. What if the boss is unhappy? Or this or that? Or I can't spend too much time. I'm going to get tired. If I get tired, this will happen. I don't want to wear myself out and pray for an hour. What other barriers are there? Uh, we need to understand the priority and 
emphasis, emphasis. I was from a brother gave salat and also some, and then have the knowledge to understand that, and then enact that. Yeah. So we're not really understanding, in the true sense, the position of salah. If you really understood what is salah in front of Allah, then we will perhaps give it more attention. Then we will perhaps make our prayers longer. Because Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, the closest a servant is with Allah is when? When are you closest to Allah? In salah, when? When you're in your? In sujuna. That's when you're closest to Allah. Because when you put your head down, you are saying to Allah, Oh Allah, I am so low in front of you. You know, you don't go put your head down in front of anybody else, do you? You think of it as a shameful thing. Even if I was to whip you and say, come and uh, bow in front of me, you would not do it. Because that's a shameful thing. You say, no, why should I bow to you? You know, you're thinking of your worth, your self-worth. Well, here it's such that you say to Allah, you're putting your head down first. And then you say, Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Glory and perfection is the one who's the most high. You are the most low, and Allah is the most high. That is the true relationship between us and Allah. Where we have completely submitted ourselves, we have put our head down on the floor and said to Allah, Oh Allah, you are you what you are, and this is my position in front of you. Now, if you truly understood that, our sajda would not last for three subhanahu wa ta'ala, it would last for much longer than that. As Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, repeat it more times. Repeat it more times, not just three times. Five times, seven times, more times. Do some dua to Allah in your sajda. Praise Allah in your sajda. That helps you to realize your true position. So we are not understanding that the brother mentioned the power of salah. The salah is where we turn to Allah on a daily basis. Every single day of our lives, even when we are sick, even when we are in a battle, no matter where we are, no matter what the circumstance is, Allah has said we pray. Why? Because we need Allah at all times. And Salah is us turning to Allah and asking. So if we really understood what Salah is, we would make a Salah longer. So here is Maryam the devout woman with the high Iman we realize that and not just realize that it, we perfect it because she realized the power of Salah so much so that she didn't have to worry about what you and I worry about for 50 years the amount of hard labor we do from the studies to the work and everything that we do she had already realized she realized the secret was to turn to Allah. So my dear brothers, this is the first thing. This is the first thing by Bari Mahi Salam that we need to understand. Now of course there are many lessons from her life, but we're not going to go through every one of those. What we'll do now is we'll take a one minute break so everybody can just stretch their legs and stand up and sit down, and then we'll go through one more thing inshallah. Before we will finish. Uh, get up and walk around a little bit because it will just help you to get your blood circulating and your mind fresh again so that you can then concentrate more inshallah as well.
to get herself in out of what she thought and perceived was a dangerous situation. But what does she do? She turns to Allah again. And she reminds that man, fear Allah. So here again, we see the exemplary character of this woman, Maryam a.s. Whenever she would find herself in a situation, what would she do? She would turn to Allah. But even when it comes to other people, what would she do? She would invite Allah to them. I say, fear Allah. And so it's through Allah, she realized she will have security. Through Allah before, she realized it's her risk. Through Allah is her security. Through Allah is her well-being. So the man says, do not, do not, do not fear. He says to her that I am free. Sent from Allah to give you some news. So he says to her, Allah has decreed for you a son. Now here is a woman who has devoted all her life to the worship of Allah. A chaste woman. Who while all other young girls out there want to be busy with other things, getting married, doing this and doing that, and all the men doing whatever they do. Here she was a chaste woman, devoting herself to Allah. And then Jibreel comes and says, Allah has decreed for you a son. She says, how is it possible when no man has touched me? So Jibreel says, well, this is what Allah has decreed for you. And he does whatever he wants. So as we learn from the Hadith of Muhammad Sallam, all Jibreel did was to blow onto her. Nobody touched her. He just blew onto her. And that was the means by which Allah then made her have a child. The purity, the chastity that she valued so much not for any other reason except because it is valid with Allah. Allah allowed her to keep it. And Allah gave her her child. Remember the dua her mother made, Allah protect her and her descendants. Well, these are the descendants, Isa alayhi salam. Now, let's just think about it for a minute. Again, put yourself into her feet. Put yourself into her shoes. A single woman devoting herself to worship. So those who come to know her will know her as what? As a chast, honest, God-fearing woman. Now, what happens when a woman gets pregnant? Her tummy starts to grow. So although initially she might hide the fact that she's pregnant, Soon a time will come when she will not be able to hide the, the fact that she's pregnant. So then, what are people going to say? What are people going to say? They're going to say, ah, you're pretending to be chest. You're pretending to be a woman of God. But you've been up to some mischief, haven't you? You've been up to some mischief. So Allah guides Mali Mali Salam to go away for a while. To go away from the people for a while. Leave the society, so to speak, and move away. And exactly that is what she does. And then the time comes for the delivery of the child of Isa and Salah. This year is a woman out in the middle of nowhere, all on her own, needing to deliver a baby with nobody to help her with no need to help her through all the pains of labor and through everything that will go on from there always constantly thinking in her mind that this baby is or could be a proof against herself this baby that's about to be born could be could bring her downfall could be the means by which people will then accuse her where they were accusing her before now they can say there you go this is proof so out of mental tension, emotional tension, and then the physical tension of having to give birth. And subhanAllah, Allah turns and helps her. At her time of need. Because of her piety, Allah helps her. He says, go 
And while she's there, he says, go by this dead palm trees. And you put in front of your feet a stream of water. And he says to her to shake the dead palm. Now who has seen dead palm trees? This brother can describe that for you. Big, massive. Big, massive, isn't it? Can't shake it easy. You can't shake it. You really can't shake it. Who has seen dead palm trees? Yeah, they're massive. The, you know, single stem that goes very high. And then you put the fruits and everything on the top. And it's massive. There's no way. If you have 10 people, you have difficulty shaking it. And Allah says to this woman, who is about to go through labor, and all the pain and the difficulties, He says to her to shake the day palm. But of course, this is Allah's way of helping His servant, who has turned to Allah and given up everything for Him. And so that's what she does. And what does she get? She gets the dates. So she has the water to quench her thirst and the need, and she has the dates. Now let's just very briefly as a side issue talk about dates. Why was dates so good in this circumstance? Because dates are very high in sugar and carbohydrates. So it will give her very quick energy. The energy she needs to deliver her baby. And not just that, after the baby is born, the womb, the uterus has to contract back down. It, it was so big to contain the baby, it now needs to contract back down to a small size. Otherwise, she will bleed to death. Simple as that. And the dates contain a substance that causes the uterus to contract down. So Allah provided for her the best thing that she needs. Water, which is the hydration, the quick energy that she needs, and then from a medical point of view, the medication she needs to remain safe on the childbirth. Another miracle of Allah. Like many miracles that happened to Maryam and Islam. And only happened because of her devotion to Allah. So here she is, she then has the child. She then has a child and she recovers from her childbirth. And she's got this little baby in a cradle. She returns to the people. And at that time Allah says to her, she takes a vow with Allah of silence and just keep it quiet. Because she knows she's going to face a huge trial. So Allah guides her to this. And guides her to this amazing thing, which is just don't say anything. Just don't say anything. Now just think about it, my dear brothers. People are here accusing you of the worst thing. The society is accusing you and putting allegations on you of the worst thing. And here I come to you, you come to me for help and I say, listen, the best tactic is to say nothing at all. And you might think to say, what, is an idiot? What, you don't want me to defend myself? For how long can I remain quiet with all these allegations? But well, Allah says to her, just keep quiet. So when she returns to the people, the people see her and the child, and they say, oh, Maryam, what have you done? What have you done? We did not expect this from you. We did not expect this from you. What have you done? So she does exactly what Allah tells her to do. Just remains quiet. And she points towards the baby. And the people say, why? Why are you about telling us about the baby? He's not going to talk to us. You answer. What have you done? So as another miracle of Allah, He makes Isa salam talk while he is a baby in the cradle. And he then stands witness for her chastity. He then stands witness and bears witness that nobody has touched her. She has done nothing wrong. We might, brothers, just read this as a story. You know, we might take the Quran now and just read Surah Ali Ryan and other personal Quran when this is mentioned. And we might read other books, just as a story, a nice, beautiful story of what happened. But we're missing the point. We're missing the point. These things that happened in the past, about which Allah tells us in the Quran, why? Why are they there in the Quran? Is the Quran a storybook? Is it a nighttime 
So, you know, fairy tales, book that you read for your child to go to sleep. You know, your little child wants to sleep, says, Mommy or Daddy, can you read me a story? So you get out your little story book and you read a story, or you make up the story as you go along, so until the child goes to sleep. Is that what the Quran is? A book of stories? Such that you put the person to sleep? Of course not. It's completely the opposite. These stories are mentioned by Allah for us to understand from them and learn the lessons from them. So subhanAllah, my dear brothers, again we see in the example of Bani Muhammad Sana, her immense trust and faith in Allah. Her immense trust and faith in Allah. From the time of her young childhood, to teenage years, to young adulthood, to the time of having a child, all these trials she faced, one after another, whether it's to do with wealth, whether it's to do with position, whether it's to do with honor, whether it's to do with her chastity, whether it's to do with any of these things, at every single step of the way, she put her trust completely in Allah and Allah alone. So much so that Allah talks about her in the Quran, and so much so that Allah tells us in the Quran that the people of Iran, the descendants of Iran, of which she is one, she's the first, and then Isa Islam and others, that they are the chosen people with Allah. And how? We see it till today. For 2,000 years now, every single person talks about them. Every single person talks about them. Allah talks about them in the Quran. Allah talks about them in the Quran. And not just in third person, by name. Just think about it. As we said before, if somebody mentions and says, Khalid, come and stand here. You know Khalid is the strongest man in the world. Or Khalid is the fastest of 100 meters or whatever. Khalid starts to feel good. He's been mentioned by name and people are seeing him. And the people will no doubt talk about him afterwards. Here is Maryam a.s. Allah is talking about her in the Quran. Which is eternal. The word of Allah. The world will come to an end, but the Qur'an will not come to an end. This is the favor of Allah to the one who devoted herself to Allah. To the one who devoted herself to Allah. My dear brothers, let me ask all of you one question. And don't feel shy to answer it. I'd like you to give me an example of when you felt scared. When you felt scared. And you pray to Allah. Give me, give me something. Tell me something. And you don't have to be shy. Can you repeat the question? Of, uh, give me an example in your own life. When you felt scared, you were afraid of something, and you turned to Allah at that time. And I'm saying this, and I'm asking this, so that not so that you can brag, but because through your example, others will also gain strength and shalom. Yes, sir. When um, I was being operated uh, for an injury, that that spirit was operated so during surgery for it. So yeah, turned to Allah. Sorry, but I was a little bit distracted by the noise I given. Do you have to have an operation? Yeah, I had to go through an operation. Uh, so uh, inceptive plastic that I injured my nose. Mm -hmm. So that time, yeah, I was scared. Now. So you had you had an injured nose. You had to have an operation. Yeah. And you, know, you turned to Allah because you were scared at the time that you were going to go through some major surgery. What did you do? How did you turn to Allah? Well, I decided uh, I would go see. Okay, you decided I would go see? Yes, and what else? Yeah, I think that was it because then the anesthesia kicked in. SubhanAllah. That's, that's excellent actually. That's very good. So the brother is here on the operating table with all these strange people around him with face, you know, face masks and everything. And instruments, you can hear in the background, they're about to cut him up and give him this deadly gas that's going to put him to sleep. Doesn't know if he's going to wake up or not. So he recites the plan. And the verse he chooses, mashallah, what is special about Ayat al Kusi? What is special about Ayat al Kusi? It's the, best. the longest Ayat of Quran. The longest Ayat of Quran is not, no. It's the best. The best Ayat of Quran? I'm not sure. But it is the verse in which we learn about Allah and about his attributes. So, I'll try to bring it up. So the Ayat al-Kusi here 
It's an amazing and beautiful verse where we learn about the attributes of Allah and His perfection. That's how the proceed. You should talk about So the brother responds, that's very good, mashallah. What else, brothers? Um, it has the uh, Ism yeah. It has the greatest name of Allah. Yeah. It has the greatest name of Allah. Yeah, I'm sorry, no, I mean, what else is it? Give me some other examples. Yeah, in your own lives. Turn towards Allah every day, every moment when we are on the road. Say Astaghfirullah. Carry on. Yep. So we turn to Allah in Allah from a daily basis. Oh, not every one of us does that. But we should, exactly right. Absolutely. How often did Muhammad Sassab used to seek refuge uh, in Allah? Uh, sorry, do you have often used to seek forgiveness from Allah on a daily basis? 200 times. He would do it many, many times. But there are authentic hadith that were said 80 times or 100 times. 100 times in the morning. In the morning and 100 times in the evening. Sure. What else? I would like some more examples. Like every day you see if there is something bad going on, people are suffering. Uh, even for a moment or so, you try to get back and pray for them or maybe pray, pray for yourself or being thankful that you're not in that situation. Yep, yeah, so, so even on a day to day basis, we hear, we know about the people who are suffering and from now on we can stop ourselves just for 30 seconds, a minute, five minutes. Pray for Allah, for yourself and for their benefit. Excellent. I'll give you my example, which is very similar to the brother's example before. Uh, my dear, one of my dear friends, who is also my dentist, said to me, I have my wisdom tooth removed. And despite being a doctor, I was very, very scared. So I thought, no, I don't want to go through this procedure. Because he looked and he said, it's going to be difficult. He already told me straight away, it's going to be a bit hard because your tooth is impacted and da 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 da. So whenever he see me, I said, listen, I'll only have it out if you give me a general study and put me to sleep. And he said, no, 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 I said, we don't need to do that. We can remove it, don't worry. I said, no. Every time I go to him, he said, come on, are we going to do it? I said, no. More than a year had passed. And then I eventually said to him, okay, I'm going to come and I'm going to get it done. And I made an appointment with him. So then I went there. And being a doctor, I took all my medications with me, all my painkillers and everything with me. And I thought, good, I'm going to be fully prepared so I can take my antibiotics, my painkillers and everything afterwards. So anyway, I got there and I'm lying down. As the brother said, you know, the dentist is ready, he's got his mask on, zzzz, and you can hear all the drills and everything going on. So I'm like, what I did, and I planned this. I, I planned that I'm going to recite the Quran. So I just lied there with my eyes closed and I just recited the Quran during the whole procedure. And when the procedure finished, he said to me, okay, I said, you can get up. And I said, what, have you finished? He goes, yeah, finished. I did not feel one little bit of pain at all. It was a difficult procedure, and I did not even feel one bit of pain. And afterwards, I did not even need one tablet of pain at all. Now, I'm not very great, but I did exactly what that brother did. Just turn to Allah and recite the Quran. Put my trust in Allah, it's only Allah who's going to save me from this fear that I've got. So, come on, brothers, let's hear a couple more examples. Yes. <clears throat> when crossing a big river and suddenly the weather changed, the boat trembled, trembling in a way that it is about to sink, that time we tend to resort to Allah more and more. So, has that happened to you? Once, once, and I get scared from that. Suddenly it happened well, the weather change into good and we cross the river. Yeah. So what do I did you make to Allah? What did you say? Uh, once at the stage I thought that it um, I'm going to drown. Right. But um, yes, yeah, I took Kursi I was reading all the time. And another Bismillah Bazira how must they learn like a full this this ayat. Yeah. And yeah, these two. So the brother as well he is mentioning he was on a boat and it was a little bit rocky and choppy uh, seas. And he's going to drown, he's going to sink. So he's turned to Allah and went to Allah, to Allah and he's the Quran as well to give the peace of mind, inshallah, and to help him escape. And if he was to drown, what better way to drown than with the name of Allah every time? What else, brothers? Let's have a couple more examples. Yes. I mean, I couldn't be able to, I, 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 
I believe that I can get two bars. I mean, it's zero out of ten. So I made the argument that this algorithm is at least four bars. I've got four bars. Okay. Uh, so the brother mentioned that he had a test and he had me preparing for it. So out of ten, he made the argument. That he was afraid he's going to get zero. So he went to work, oh, like, give me at least four. So I like him to fall. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> what else, Ishaba? Mm -hmm. Yes? It's actually a story of talking to a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. person. But Hanabai like, was um, working in a construction company. Um, and he was asked to do something illegal, sign and agree about a certain uh, cheating. And he refused. He said, and he was up the bribe. And he said, I will not defeat my kids are anything haram, and I'm doing this for the sake of Allah. Because I fear Allah. The person insisted so much. At the end of the day, they accused him of being, you know, doing that stuff, and he got fired, and he got arrested. So he was in jail, and he was making dua, or dua in Qatar. And he was reciting Surah Yusuf, which is a, which is a surah basically how Surah Yusuf was accused falsely, and he was in jail as well. Now, subhanAllah, a few days later, something fell on that man's head and he went into a coma. Mm -hmm. And he woke up from the coma after a month and just said one sentence. Talabt Aba Abdullah. Aba Abdullah Mahloum. I have made mischief against him. And he went back to his coma. So the kids took him out of jail. And that man died after that. Mm -hmm. the, the last action of that man was something like this. And you would think that also, um, you know, one of the and one of the things that he would keep behind is a pious kid. When the man went to him and he said that I was affected and I'm taking care of my sick father and this and I've lost my work, he said, that's his grave, go get your money. And he didn't even leave a pious son behind too. Yeah. So, um, so that yeah. You know, sometimes you hear stories and you get tears in your eyes, don't you? Oh, yes. It's amazing. What else was? The reason I'm saying this is because, you know, we're not here to learn about Malim Islam because we're academics and professors and we're doing a PhD such that, you know, we gather all the knowledge. The, all that is written in the books. But whenever we read the Quran or the Hadith or any good story, it really makes a lot of sense for us to sit down and ponder over them. And ponder meaning to think and think hard and think deep. And not just that, think deep and how it applies to yourself. How this verse you're reciting, or this hadith you just come across, how does it apply to me? That's the question we should always be asking. Because the Quran is the message of Allah that He's given to you for your benefit. So whenever you come across a verse or a hadith, don't try and apply to everybody else around you, apply it to yourself. So when we learn about Bayan, we can sit here and have a nice little story session and tell the whole full story because there's a lot more about our life than we have in time. And we can spend the whole hour jamming it all in and then we finish, we break up and we go. But it would be much better, I thought, that we sit down and we see how does that apply to us. We see around us people doing similar things. But what was great about her? She persisted in doing it. She was persistent. She was steadfast. At every turn, at every minute, at every day, this is what she was doing. Which is what made her one of those who most of us have perfected her religion. One more example, inshallah. Yes, brother. Uh, uh, once I was just like going in this mountainous area, like uh, our family lives in a town, and then there is mountainous area, some other family members live there. So I almost left there for at Zohar time and it was a three hours like journey, I had to deliver something there. So like I just went there and while I was coming back they told me not to go because it's like almost late was Maghrib or something like that and I said no, I just make it to you know the town back again. So when I was coming back, uh, what happened is that slowly it started raining and like it was all you know dark everywhere and it was mountainous and you know the road on the side of it there is a river. Mm -hmm. So at the night time it like really flows you yes. know fast and there was roars of the, that river and suddenly like there was very fast wind blowing too fast like actually this it's a dam on the side so when the wind blows it's like too fast so I was on my bike and like it was so fast that the bike was like almost rattling so I was, it was going left and right and secondly there were thunders you know light lightning 
So the lightning would like go and I couldn't see anything because it went on and off, on and off. So I couldn't see anything on the road and it was all curvy. The road was curvy. So like I, I was almost afraid and everything. Then where am I going to go? And the rain was so fast and I couldn't take shelter anywhere. So I just like, I was like, oh Allah, please help me. I'm, I'm stuck and I won't do it again. So ultimately, yeah, I don't remember actually what I said, but I think I, I said if I reach home safely, I'll just offer a few nawafil, maybe 10 or something, I don't remember actually. Yeah, so what happened is that there was a, uh, ultimately after 15 or some 20 minutes, we found a small village, 2, 3 or maybe 7, 8 houses, and there was a man, I just knocked at his door and he came out, and there was a masjid in front of his house. So his house was only one room house, and it was, you know, the mud house, like, yeah, yeah, they are not uh, cemented. So yeah, so he gave me the keys for the mosque and you know, he made me sleep there, I slept there in the morning then I left. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, that. So we all turn to Allah, isn't it, when they're having difficulties with the season, a little bit choppy and then stuff like that. And inshallah, you know, of course Allah talks about the Quran itself. He says, you know, and this is to the people who live in the desert. He says, when the seas are choppy and the seas are deadly and you're afraid, you turn to Allah. But the people, you know, unfortunately, they forget Allah when they come to safety. Um, and this is that test that we don't forget Allah when they come to save uh, Just one thing I want to mention, you know this man who gave me shelter at the mosque, he was very poor, like too poor, you can't even imagine. But you know this is the difference, when some, uh, this is not about being poor or rich. He made me, uh, you know, uh, sleep there, then he brought, because my clothes were wet, he brought some old clothes for me. And then he brought some bread which was, I like, couldn't even like swallow that, it was so hard. And you know it was some curry. I mean, nothing in it, just a simple curry, but at least he brought it for me yeah. because he knew I am a guest or something like that. So if it's not about poor, sometimes the poor people, they are so generous, uh, and you feel too good about them. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah amazing, absolutely. Okay, so what we'll do, we'll, we'll finish off with that, but before we finish, I want to uh, inform everybody and make an announcement about something that's coming up, inshallah. Uh, for some of you may have received this uh, flyer that I just distributed before. Uh, hands of those who received it. I can you see your hands? Yes, a few people have. Okay, inshallah. Uh, I didn't bring many copies, but uh, you know, for those who haven't, uh, you can see it from the other people as well. Uh, but this topic that I spoke about, about Maryam uh, is as we just saw, we, we look at two aspects, two incidents really in her life. And about what made her great, as Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned. What this course is, is titled Women Companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Their Lives, Inspiration and Legacy. It's going to be on Saturday, November the 22nd. From my understanding, your exam should have been finished by that time, from what I uh, gather. So it's on a Saturday, it's a full day uh, workshop or course uh, from 9 to 7. And I encourage all of you to come to it, inshallah, if you're able to come. And if you feel you're not able to come, make an effort to come to it. And the reason is because a few things, and let me mention a couple of things to you. Firstly, we learned a lot about the male companions of Prophet so, And it's easy for us to find information about Abu Bakr or Uthman or Omar or Ali or other great uh, companions of Prophet But seldom do we have time or do we find